one of the questions that we're going to ask members of ART, and some of them are here this morning, so you get the little pre, uh, the preview of what's coming. And I hope this will, this will tell us who listened to the worship service on Sunday and who didn't. I'm going to ask everybody to tell me what your passion is. I want you to think about it at home or if you're here. I want you to think, what is your passion? What's your passion? Now, don't say your family. Everybody's passionate about their family. We all love our parents. We love our children. We love our siblings. We love each other and our families. At least I hope we do. But I want you to think about what is your passion. I want you to think about that in terms of what it is that you do in your life. Now, there are two words that are very similar, and one is avocation, the other is vocation. So what's the difference between an avocation and a vocation? This comes from the thought company online. It says, an avocation is a hobby or any other activity taken up in addition to one's regular work. It may especially refer to something that is a person's true passion or interest, as opposed to vocation, which is one's principal occupation, often used in the context of a calling to a particular way of life or course of action. Now, the words are similar because they both come from the same Latin root, which is vocare, which means to call or to summon. And I think that's why it's scary to think even about your passion in church, because how is it going to be used by your pastor who says, oh, I have a passion for people. Well, we're going to put you on the evangelization committee. I have a passion for cooking. You get to cook for everybody in the church. Now, I don't want you to worry too much, but it does scare people to talk about a vocation or a vocation or a passion because of that word call. It terrifies people. People don't want to open themselves up to God's call because they're afraid it's going to be to something particular. Maybe they think it's like the pastor's call. I don't want to do that. I don't want to preach for a living. I don't want to move from church to church. I remember saying that myself at a point in my life. It took me three years trying to talk myself out of my call after college before I went into seminary at age 25. Or maybe you're afraid you'll be called to do what Anna and Nathan Glenn have done from our congregation. They live and work in Liberia as agricultural missionaries. Just a few weeks ago, we had them here to share about their mission and their ministry together. They talked about the year they've had with getting COVID and malaria and having their Jeep burn up and having all sorts of problems in the mission. But they also talked about the joy that is there too. People are afraid, if I answer my call to God, God's going to send me to the other part of the earth, the farthest place from where I am, and I don't want to do that. So what happens if you're called to be like Paul, even? Paul, the one who wrote much of what we call the New Testament. He had quite a life, didn't he? Shipwrecked, imprisoned, and finally killed for his faith and his proclamation of Jesus as Lord. I don't want to end up a martyr. So I don't want to think about being called. Or we're tempted when we hear these stories about people like Peter and Paul, and even Isaiah the prophet, or hear a pastor's story of call to say, whew, at least this does not apply to me. But everyone who is a person of God in Jesus Christ is called by God. Let's look at the lessons and talk about that. Now, Isaiah was called to a particular ministry, the minister of, ministry of a prophet. Not an easy time to have. And think about his story of call. It is one of the wildest, most spectacular, technicolor, full screen adaptations you could ever imagine. Because he sees God on the throne, which means he's looking up. He sees God on the throne in heaven, and God is so immense in God's robes, just the hem of the robes touches earth and fills the temple. The temple's filled with smoke, and here come the seraphs. Now, lots of times churches will talk about cherubim and seraphim, and we'll have angels with wings and especially cherubs, we think of as little pudgy babies with wings, which is why most churches call their little children's choir a cherub choir, which is quite appropriate because cherubs were these little beastly things that flew around. And the seraphim, as we heard, had six wings to cover their eyes, to cover their face, to cover their feet, which is a euphemism for another part of their body, actually, and two to fly with. They were huge, and God rode through the skies on the seraphim, in the words of the psalmist. And in the middle of this, Isaiah gets a call. And his response would be like mine, woe is me. Now, if you want a better modern interpretation, it would be, what the heck for woe is me? It's, a, it's an exclamation of good gravy Marie, what is happening here? And Isaiah blurts out what we all would feel in that moment. I can't talk for you, God. I am a person of unclean lips. 
And God says, I can fix that. And so an angel flies with tongs with a hot coal and touches his mouth and cleans him of his sin. Pretty big story there. Now, Paul, maybe you're thinking, we didn't read the story of Paul's call. We know that, don't we, very well. He's knocked off his horse on the way to Damascus. He's blinded. He hears the voice, Jesus saying, why are you persecuting me, Saul? And he's led to a place where Ananias will later heal him, and he will regain his strength, and he will be baptized, and he will go out, and he will proclaim God's message to the Gentile world. Thank you, Paul, or we wouldn't be here today. We hear the story today not of his call, but what happens in response to his call, how he lives it out in Corinth. Corinth, a place I was blessed to visit, and the ancient city is still there in ruins. You can stand exactly where Paul stood to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not only did he live there for quite some time, he practiced his real vocation there, which was as a tent maker. And he brought many people to Christ at a time of great division, much like we live in now, where there were great class distinctions and distinctions between people and who was in and who was out and who was welcome, who was not. Very much the situation we have going on here today. And then there's Peter's story, the vocation of a fisherman. We understand that one, at least we think we do, because we have folks here who love to fish. We have folks here who take a fishing trip every year together. We have people who, anytime they can, will get just their fishing pole and they'll go out and sit on the side of the bank and probably take a nap and wait for something to bite or not bite. I've been fishing one time in my life. I went with two of my friends from seminary. I was the only one who caught a fish and I wouldn't bait my own hook because I thought, I'm not going to put a hook through a worm's head. So I used brown swagger and cheddar white cheddar popcorn. I caught the only fish that day. Then I was under the impression, unfortunately, that fish died as soon as they bit the hook. These two friends of mine said, why don't we put a hook through your lip and see if you die? I'm getting a little off course here, but that was my experience of fishing. I had to throw him back because he was just too small. We understand that fishing is something that lots of people love to do. Maybe, maybe fishing is your passion, I don't know. But it's not so much fun when it's a vacation, is it? And a avocation should be a lot of fun. But here's where the story really is so weird to understand because here are these fishermen. They have come in from a night that was very disappointing. They fished at night because it was so hot during the day that the fish wouldn't come as close to the surface. They came in after working an entire night exhausted and frustrated because they'd caught absolutely nothing. We've all had days like that, haven't we, at work, where you feel like you've gone in and gone through the motions and nothing good has come out of it. They're tired. They're washing their nets, putting them away, and here comes Jesus. They don't really know much about him. Perhaps they'd heard of him at this point, because in Luke's gospel, the story's a little bit different than it is in the other gospels about how the call comes to them. And here they are, washing their nets, ready to go home and sleep until they have to get back at work again. And they're depressed, probably, and frustrated because they have nothing to feed their families with, nothing to trade with, nothing to earn a living with. Jesus says, after preaching from their boat, put out. I want you to try it again. Now, this is where the story becomes very interesting because I think if I had been Peter, I would have said, who do you think you are, carpenter's son, telling me how to fish, telling me about my occupation? But there's something about Jesus that is so compelling that he just says, what you ever, whatever you say, sir, and they go out, and Jesus tells them to put the nets down again. And we cannot imagine the surprise that they have because they catch so many fish, the boat is about to sink, which makes Peter realize this is not just some ordinary itinerant preacher. This man is from God. And he falls to his knees, and he says, get away from me. I am a sinful man. Stories about vocation and avocation, stories about passion, stories about call. But what they have more important is not just that they're stories of call and answers to call, but who God calls. Why would God call Isaiah to do this when Isaiah, by his own admission, says, I am a man of unclean lips. I don't belong here. I'm a sinner. Why are you calling me? And you have Peter and his cohorts. Simple, uneducated, ordinary people, not the type anyone would listen to. They had no social standing. They had no place of privilege. We know Peter is going to just make a mess of things along the way to the point of denying even knowing Jesus on the night before he dies. And then you have Paul. 
Paul in the story we read this morning, but Saul of Tarsus, the great persecutor of God's people. Why in the world would God use someone like Saul? The question I asked myself when I received my call to ordain ministry, why would God call someone like me? There's a joke that goes around in seminaries that says, here I am, Lord, send somebody else, please. So why would God call these folks? And why would God call us to fish for people? Now, we don't fish with hooks in this story. It's a net that gets dropped out. And it brings in everything, every kind of fish there is. But in the church, sometimes we want a particular kind of fish, don't we? We want fish that sort of fit with the theme we've got going. Fish that are the same color as us. Fish that are maybe the same accent, the same background, the same history. When people try to grow their church, sometimes I hear them say things to me like, we just need to get five more good families in here with kids. But that leaves a lot of folks out, doesn't it? You want people just like you. You're not in a church. You're in a museum, possibly, at this point, or a social club. But if you want to be in the body of Christ, it looks very different, no matter who is here. My last appointment in West Virginia, I served in Harmony United Methodist Church on Route 11, which is called both uh, the Martinsburg Pike, the Hagerstown Pike, no matter where you live along the road, it goes very far, it goes into Virginia, it goes into Pennsylvania. Route 11, which preceded Route 81, so you can imagine the traffic that we saw there. My church was directly between two Baptist congregations, both belonging to the Southern Baptist Congregation Convention, excuse me, the Southern Baptist Convention, but they would not speak to each other. They wouldn't talk to each other. One tried to have services in common, but they wouldn't, the other church wouldn't budge because the minister of music at the new congregation, it was a new church start, happened to be a woman, and because they called her a minister, even though she never preached, they would not worship with them. They certainly wouldn't worship with the Methodists. We invited them many times to share with Thanksgiving, and they said they wouldn't meet with us. So one day, the Baptist New Start Church, that pastor said, let me take you out for a cup of coffee so we get to know each other. And we sat there drinking coffee, and I said, you know, we've tried to get your neighbors, and he said, they won't be with us either. I said, why not? He said, because we're not the right kind of Baptist for them. And that's when he said to me something I'll never forget about calling people and who comes to church and who's welcome and who's not. He said, Jesus called me to catch the fish. He never called me to clean them. But sometimes we want them cleaned and packaged nicely and the way we think they should be before we want them in our congregations, don't we? That's sad, because what we learn from these three stories of call, these three stories really of response more than call, since we didn't get Paul at the beginning, but what does he say? I am the least of these. I'm the least of these. I persecuted the church. He never moves away from that, which is why I always say if you want a good church, go to a 12-step program, go to AA or a group like that, where you are welcome because they know you're broken and they've been broken themselves, and they know that people on their way to freedom from addiction, people in recovery will slip and slide and go back, and they are still welcome in that fellowship because they let God do the cleaning. They just do the catching. And the catching when people are falling is what they're doing. These are stories of grace. These are stories of God saying, I don't care who you think you are. I don't care how bad you think you are. I can use you. I can use what you know how to do. I can use your passion. I can use your vocation. Because the fishermen, they knew how to catch fish. And they knew how to talk to people. One of the things that a lot of people don't know about fishermen in the first century is they were probably multilingual because they had to do business with all kinds of people. They knew what it was to work hard and have frustrating days and still get up the next day and do it all over again. God can use skills like that. God can use our passion and our vocation as well. God can teach you an old dog new tricks. And Paul never stopped telling people what he had done in the past so that they would know that there was hope for them. So I hope that us today, I hope that we here will go out into the world and welcome people to the body of Christ. Because what does Paul do in that very diverse community in Corinth where people were drawing distinctions among themselves, he tells them the story of who we are in Jesus Christ. Christ who came, Christ who did these wonderful things, Christ who died, Christ who was raised for our sake, 
Christ who lives and prays and reigns for us until the day when he comes again. He tells them that story with passion and conviction and they come to him. We are here today because these men so long ago, beginning with Isaiah, the great prophet of the exile, we didn't read what he was given to do. We cut it off at a good point today. We just heard his call. But as soon as he says, here I am, send me, God says, I'm going to send you to these stiff-necked people of mine, my chosen people. I'm going to let them hit bottom. And Isaiah says, how long do I have to say that? And he said, until they're all in exile, but then you get to bring them home. Sometimes what we're called to do in God's name is not the easiest thing to do. But we're called and we're equipped. God doesn't call people who are well-equipped. God equips people who are called. God equips us when we're faithful to do what it is that we're asked to do in God's name, which is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. That is what we're called to do, and we can all do that. We are here because someone thought enough of us to tell us the story of God's redeeming love in Jesus Christ. We are here today because someone loved us enough to let us know. We are here today because before there was an internet, before there was a newspaper, before there was any sort of broadcast system, these men gave their lives to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, the opposite is true. I use this example so much sometimes that my former intern Sam says, you got to let Hitler off the hook, not in terms of what he did was okay. But look at Hitler. He was one man surrounded by a very small group of people who were as diseased in mind as he was. One man with a small group of people around him could not exterminate 11 million people. Six to 11 million is the number that are estimated to have been killed during the Holocaust. Jews, homosexuals, anyone who disagreed with him. He was hell-bent on world domination. He would not have been able to do that by himself. But the people around him did not say no to him. They let him go, and they joined with him, and no one stood up and said a thing. That's the opposite of the story we're reading this morning when we were all called to share good news, to share hope, to share the word of God, the very word of God with God's people. And it's so wonderful when you share it, especially with those who don't know the story, who don't know that God loves them, who don't know that there is grace, abundant grace that will come into their hearts and change them. God's not going to touch us with a burning coal anymore on our lips. But God's going to call those from the boats that they're in. So what are we going to do? Are we going to take God's grace? Are we going to allow it to fill us and use us and change us into the people that God wants us to be? I hope your answer is yes. Don't refuse God's grace because this is a story of grace. It's a story of God's passion for us. Jesus Christ had a passion to bring people to his Father for love and grace and mercy and peace, not for judgment, not for sending them to hell, but for raising them to new life and raising them to the day of heaven. As Isaiah looked to heaven to see God's flowing raiment and the, just the hem could fill the entire temple. This is who God is, bigger than we are, bigger than we are, full of grace, full of truth, full of peace. All we need to do is accept the grace and then share it with someone else so it overflows and bubbles out of us. I don't know what your story of call is, but I know that you're called. I know that you're called to work in the church. So I want you to talk to those around you today. I want you to say, what is my passion? What is your passion? How can we use what we're passionate about? How can we use what we love to do to bring people to God and Jesus Christ? And God will show you the way. So if you have a passion for mission, we have a place for you at Epworth Church. We have places on the Baltimore County Christian Work Team. We have another team that goes out every year, and we're hoping that they'll be able to go out this year as well because we couldn't last year because of COVID. There's so much work to be done now that the pandemic is moving to a place where we can gather again. We're going to jumpstart everything that we had going before. If your passion is for feeding people, we can put you in touch with the Cockeysville Food Pantry, or you can bring food in here every day, or you can cook for people who are in need. That was one thing that happened when Carolyn Schubert had her fall, and we love her. And good morning, Carolyn, because I know you're watching us this morning because you told me you were going to be here on Sunday. Before I even had a chance to call Tom and say, if you need any meals, meals were already in their home. The same thing with Elaine Grudowski when she had her stroke. People responded and poured their hearts out. 
We need to do that with each other here, but we need to spread that beyond these walls that we invite the whole world to share with us what we know in Jesus Christ. That no matter who we are, no matter how low we think we are, no matter how filthy we think our mouths are, God can redeem and use us. We just need to remember that we once were lost and now we're found. Once before we didn't understand, but now in Christ we have our understanding of who he is. And we allow him to use us to send us into the world to bring others the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. We didn't sing, I will make you fishers of men this morning, but we sang that wonderful song from the faith we sing. Let me read you the last verse again. And you good Christians, one and all who'd follow Jesus' way, come leave behind what keeps you bound to trappings of our day. And listen as he calls your name to come and follow near. For he still speaks in varied ways to those his call will hear. Don't let your self-doubt stop you. Don't let your past be a hindrance to the future that God wants to give you in Jesus Christ. Don't let mistakes that you've made define you, but be defined by grace and mercy. And then when he calls you, say, here I am, Lord. Here I am. Send me. And God may send you to Liberia, but most likely God's going to send you to someone in your neighborhood who needs to know the good news of love and grace and mercy and peace. To the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.